So everyone's still here, wonderful. It's been really inspiring and interesting to hear all the different research perspectives. And we, I guess, even though I'm actually married to Peter uh, and I'm her, I am heard it more or less every day and every week how, how things are, are going in the branch, so to speak, it's really interesting to see the complexity and the different, uh, uh, let's say, uh, political uh, like challenges there, there really is at stake. Um, I can come from a slightly different perspective, namely the artistic practice and, and, and the, like more the perceptual perspective on, on how the aspects of the underwater soundscape can be made audible through, through, through an artistic uh, perspective. And I'm going to try to use my computer and my, uh, this one at the same time. Let's see if I could manage to do it because I have some notes here. Um, just as uh, Sanna said, um, I'm a sound artist um, and I've been been mainly working with site specificity as an artistic practice uh, and, and sound installations. I've been doing sound installations for quite many years. Uh, I'm the, I think would say that the last 15 years has uh, specifically deal with, with site specificity in, in public space. Or just to, 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 to cut it short, to describe my practice, very simple, how, how I, with sound or through sound and listening, actually can exper experience or explore and, and make perceivable aspects of a site that are normally not perceivable. Uh, and I've been doing around 30 different site specific, often long-term uh, projects. Um, um, I've also been lately on generally really interested in, in the ocean as a public space for, uh, for uh, artistic uh, site-specific exploration. Um, yeah, and it's been really my, my interest in how art can actually transform information or art's capacity to transform in information of global relevance into an embodied sonic experience because Quite a lot of the, the uh, uh, data that uh, Julia, um, uh, Matthias and Peter talked about today, they are uh, games as, uh, uh, they, they get access, they get lo lo lots of, of uh, uh, data through underwater technology, partly based on, on hydrophone or underwater microphones, but they are rarely listened to, they are transformed into uh, visual models or statistical data and things like that. So what happens with all data that are actually uh, generated but no one's listened to and what can be used with this data? That's been a kind of uh, target or kind of, kind of topic that I've been interested in for quite a long time. Yeah, and these are just a few few projects that I've been doing, uh, spanning from uh, a project that I did together with Peter on the, on the left side, where I was mainly like trying to uh, trying to uh, sonify the eventually uh, um, changing um, ch changing stream of the North Atlantic current. Is this correct, more or less? <laughs> yeah, to to a more to, to exploring the harbor area in Hamburg. Uh, and on the right side, it's actually a project that I just started up uh, a month ago uh, together with the glaciologist Nina Kirschner, and that's also part of my post postural po post post po help me for God's sake. <laughs> I said I'm in, I'm in the last speaker, so I'm allowed to like stumble. <laughs> what to say? Postdoctoral uh, project uh, uh, that's uh, you, that where she's using hydrophone technology to get, get, gain knowledge about glaciers and the carving, um, and the the idea. Uh, of uh, uh, exploration, artistic exploration of the like fragile environments of the underwater uh, underwater uh, areas or underwater soundscape. That's not. I'm not very. I'm really not unique. There is a kind of lot, a, a broad tradition, which I do absolutely not have time to go into today. But uh, I mean, there is a quite lot of, of other artists that are working in the same area. Um, such as, um, yeah, Jonna Winderen, Leah Barclay and Jakob Kierkegaard words uh, or names, if you don't even already know them, that you should definitely check out. That's f from different perspective with uh, mainly quite advanced uh, technology been, been exploring um, the, the underwater soundscape from, uh, from an artistic perspective. But what I want to show with you today or share with you today is actually one specific project that I did with actually Peter, Matthias and Julia a couple of years ago. So I think it's, it's a kind of nice uh, like summing up or wrapping up of this day that, uh, that is called um, Mare Balticum. 
Uh, and it's actually, it's, uh, it, it's a project that I, uh, that's part of the EU finance research project Baltic Sea Information on the acoustic soundscape, which I think all of you in somehow touched. I saw it on, on, from, from the maps. You were, Peter, talking a little bit more specifically about it. Uh, it was research of, was it five or six nations? Like, yeah, Finland, Sweden, Denmark, Poland, Germany and Estonia, yeah, that was that were m m more or less uh, trying to get get an idea of of how the uh, underwater soundscape of the Baltic sounded uh, like. Uh, and what I want to do is to kind of point or pinpoint a concrete process of what it actually wh what does it mean to transform. Uh, scientific data to sound, because it's very easy. We, are, as an artist or whatever, we have the ambition and the ideas, uh, but how, how is it done? And, and what kind of synergy effects might arise between science and art on the one hand? And on the second, what kind of infrastructure does that actually require? except for being married to one of the art and uh, one of the researchers because of course but that's just another story uh, I, i'm going to go actually into details a little bit more uh, on that later on uh, but i want to share a uh, i think it's five minutes short or long film with you uh, so just just take it easy yep And don't worry, the sound will come in a little while.
Okay. So just as Peter said previously today, uh, the purpose with the BIOS projects was to, through underwater technology, uh, measure the sound, sound uh, levels in the Baltic in order to create models or sound maps of the, of the Baltic uh, synchroni synchronized. That is, what's happening on different places are possible to, to kind of combine uh, uh, in the very same moment. Um, so what is at stake here from, from an artistic point of uh, da, uh, perspective? It's about really important data that is supposed to be transformed into an, an artistic perspective. And how, how do you do with this enormous kind of uh, uh, material or loads of material, uh, uh, several terabytes of, of sound recordings from a whole year, I think it was, right? Um, and I would call it the almost impossible process of transforming scientific data into an artistic uh, experience. Um, and it's on the one hand, it's, it's about really how scientific data of global relevance can be transformed into an embodied, uh, embodied sonic experience. And, and on the other hand, how can this become an experience in the in the public space, and that was the kind of crucial overall uh, uh, um, task from my perspective. Um, and my involvement in this uh, in this uh, project was at a quite uh, early stage because I, of course, because uh, we, uh, I, I know Peter and, and he told me about the project. But what's really interesting is because it was an e uh, EU project. Uh, normally, when you restore, for instance, a forest or something, you put up information sheets or information uh, posters about that this uh, this uh, kind of uh, uh, um, forest or whatever or natural area has been have been uh, uh, renovated or re restored but you can't do that when you when you kind of uh, uh, approach a global phenomena as a sea so that the idea was that already from the already beginning bring in an artist that kind of uh, get the possibility to get access to this huge material uh, and kind of make it available for, uh, for a broader audience in that sense uh, and if we look, uh, I know that uh, Peter showed this uh, previously as well. Uh, it was uh, on 38 different spots uh, during one year. Uh, and um, how do you do it? How do you like? How 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 kind of what kind of selection do you do? Because it's a, such an enormous uh, enormous uh, uh, site, and and the way how do you transform it, and how do you what what kind of uh, selection process do you have? Uh, in my case, I mean that there, there is as many many uh, possibilities that there there are artists. I would say, but from my perspective, I started to scale it down into. Uh, eight or 12 different uh, uh, reasons. And I picked uh, the material, the, the material uh, from every 15 minutes, uh, every hour, two days in the month throughout the whole year uh, as, as the kind of uh, basic material for the sound installation. Um, and this is, of course, how do you actually, how, how, how do you make a kind of uh, logical uh, description of these kind of data because it's quite co it's around 1700 hours uh, of data that i was listening through uh, so basically uh, i made my own little notes where i tried to detect different kind of sound sources this is of course totally un from a uh, scientific point of view totally uh, uh, non scientific but nevertheless it was working as a kind of methods of, of trying to uh, uh, trying to um, yeah uh, order the, the huge bunch of material from from these uh, 12 different sites uh, yellow material uh, yellow um, for instance yellow um, mar markers meant like uh, noise, uh, pink and uh, red colors, that's different si kinds of, of uh, um, vessels uh, and things like that. Uh, and, and yeah, so blue, uh, blue markers, it's uh, um, 
fish activity. Uh, and in that sense, I try to uh, create my own, own kind of archive. And this is the same spot uh, in, in different uh, uh, months, so to speak, um, where, you, where you can see. And just as I mentioned, it's, it's around, it was around uh, 1,700 hours to go through and, and, and just sit and listening, listening through the material. Uh, and what do you do with this huge pro uh, this material once you organized it in a, in a way? There is, of course, enormously a lot of different possibilities. Uh, I refer to this as... Um, uh, yeah, we can listen to this. It won't be more sexy than this, so you can switch it off. Uh, this is more, more or less what I was sitting and listening through, uh, li listening to for, for many of those days. Uh, so it's basically, yeah, basically white noise based material with, I think what you heard was something uh, quite active there. This is a sound sample from the, I think, uh, the south of Denmark, when you can hear the chain from an anchor or something like that for the trained uh, ear. Uh, but of course, it's about trying to sit and detect possibilities in, the, in, in this kind of white, noisy uh, ground uh, material. Um, and the next step was more or less how, how do I create a spatial experience from this? Uh, and from my perspective, as I mentioned, from these 12 sites, uh, I kind of organized each of the place as one, uh, one point in the exhibition hall, which was, was initially a 157 meter long tunnel in, in, in an island of Gotland. Uh, so it's a, basically, it's about, about the choices one, one do. And it's also how to put together the material in a uh, composition, uh, which, which it basically is a rel trying to, to uh, establish a re relation between the specific sites, in this case the tunnel, uh, the sound material, this, this quite huge uh, archive of, of uh, sounds, as well how, how the visitor, the performative aspects of the visitor, should, it, should he or she uh, sit down, listen, laying down or, or walk, that's all, all kind of uh, affects the experience of the work, work quite much, as well as the textual, textual information. How much, uh, how much shall I put focus on the experience in terms of a conceptual work, that you have a kind of pre-knowledge what this work is about, or can you really experience the whole uh, complexity by just opening the door to the tunnel and, and experience the work? This, I mean, this is the, one of the, the kind of debates in contemporary art, I guess, the relation between the perceptual experience and the, the conceptual uh, level. Um, so I think these these are things that are really what was really complex because it's not only about coming to the tunnel with the material, put up the speakers, and after like five four hours sound testing, okay, finish, let the audience in. It's about a really long process where I was spending a month in these tunnels to to kind of learn about the the, the natural frequencies of the tunnel, how they worked, and what, what was not, what kind of material that was not working, uh, issues about uh, distance between loudspeakers and what the, how that would, have, would affect the, the experience of the, the different uh, uh, spots or, or places, so to speak. So in the end, I think it's, it's about getting the most, less worst of out, uh, out of a very complex uh, situation. Um, yeah. So in this case, I, I very carefully picked a very big distance between each of the speakers in order to be really so the audience could really be able to experience each spot as a single uh, localization, uh, which could represent the, the distinct place in, in the Baltic. Um, yeah, <clears throat> and I think 
there is no conclusion because there is, this is not a kind of scientific work in that sense, but I think what I wanted to do was in somehow to put focus on how a process could see, it could look like, uh, and in, in what way uh, this work might, might uh, uh, evoke the possibility to experience the complexities as uh, uh, Matthias, Julia and Peter talked about today in terms of an artistic experience, which might give another uh, kind of, um, shall we say, experience than, than the uh, sonic maps or the uh, different kind of uh, papers that are more, more directed to, to, a, to a, a very um, skilled audience, but this is a kind of uh, opens up the possibility to, to address a broader audience in that sense. Uh, and it's of course not about that art should be a kind of instrument for a specific political purpose or anything, that's another discussion I would say. Um, but I think it might, might show the kind of synergies that, that is possible between science and art. Uh, and I think I would like to add that I have a quite pragmatic uh, um, perspective or position when it comes to when talking about synergies. I think that uh, science could do their things and art should do have their... We are addressing our audience and our uh, perspective. But there are... Uh, if It's about um, kind of make possible a, a kind of technical infrastructure that this bias project actually made possible uh, in order to... to uh, make possible this kind of artistic or uh, scientific uh, cooperation. There are, of course, uh, uh, re like art artist residences at the icebreaker Oden, uh, also up in the, in, in the Antarctica, uh, is it the Wegener Institute and so on. But uh, there is no really, there is no kind of stronger relation between the infrastructure that is actually existing both at Oden and, and down in the in, in, in the is it called the Weger station? Weger Institute. So I think this is one, one of the uh, targets and something that I would really emphasize that this is something that is needed because coming back to the fact that uh, I'm married to Peter who was uh, like conducting the project, uh, I think it's uh, it's not it, it's it should be possible to establish infrastructures so uh, which doesn't uh, require that you actually know uh, uh, the the kind of uh, researchers or scientists but the, but that it, it it needs an, another a stronger uh, infrastructure uh, organization i would say and on the other hand it is as well a question of the the uh, responsibility of the curator because as I showed here, it's not only about uh, uh, implementing sound in a tunnel, it's a very long and complex uh, project or process which, uh, which uh, requires a curator that understands this, uh, this process. <laughs>